do. Rabbi Yisrael Gaisinski is, is a Rosh Yeshiva. He is the head of the Yeshiva Torah Or, and uh, he specializes, he's an author of books, uh, specializes in um, Hasidic teachings, as well as uh, um, all, ty- all areas of Judaic uh, law and Judaic uh, in Talmud study. And, um, and uh, he really is a, what we call a eshkoil, ish hakoil boy, someone who has, uh, is multi-talented. And uh, with no further ado, Rabbi Yisrael Gazinski. Okay, so first of all, Rabbi Smith, I'm gonna have to get you back for that one day. And I also, also wondering if, uh, if I still need to introduce myself. I, I guess we're, that counts, right? I was born and bred in Brooklyn and yeah, I moved here like almost 10 years ago, Hanukkah, and one week will be 10 years from when we moved to Miami and we're involved in this wonderful program of helping beginners of all stages to learn more about Judaism and connect to their soul, connect to Hashem. Okay, but let's get with the program. So to, like Rabbi Smith mentioned, today is known, the, tw- the 19th and the 20th day of Kislev is known as the Rosh Hashanah, the new year, like the Rosh Hashanah of the Hasidists. The Hasidic movement celebrates this day as its Rosh Hashanah. This is the day when in 1772, the successor of the Baal Shem Tev, is known as the Rabbi Dov Ber, the Magid of Mizrich, this, this, the preacher from the city of Mizrich, his passing was on this day in 1772, which pretty much ended the second generation of the whole Hasidic movement. And it was the beginning of the leadership of, of Rabbi Schneir Zalman, the author of the Tanya, the founder of Chabad. And, and, and more famous, in, ni- in 1798, a decade and a half later, there was a whole story how there were... Unfortunately, in the beginning of the Hasidic movement in the early years or generations, there was a lot of misunderstanding and confusion. And, and there were, unfortunately, some extreme fanatics who, who felt that, they were so, that the Hasidic Jews were so wrong and so, so off with, and against Judaism that they even felt you could do terrible things against them, including slandering them to the government and, and the, the Alter Rebbe, as he was known, of Shnei Zaman, ended up being uh, falsely accused of treason, and it was very, very dangerous imprisonment, and he was released on this day, in 1798, on the 19th day of Kislev, and the, the 20th as well, it became a two-day celebration, but I wasn't going to go into the story too much, maybe Rabbi Smith will do that with you another time, but that's the special background of the day and it's called the Rosh Hashanah the, became the, the like the new year and like we know about the regular Rosh Hashanah it's not just the beginning of the year but it's the Rosh Hashanah it's the head like the head influences the whole body so too this day has a, is so powerful that it influences our entire year and the question is in what way how does this that's a that's what we're going to try to talk about how do, in what way does uh, Hasidus empower and affect our lives. But first, we're going to have to define some important uh, terms. What exactly is Hasidus? It's, we know so much people that Hasidim, we, we hear about them a lot. Maybe some of us consider ourselves affiliated with Hasidic movement or connected, but it's actually a hard term to define. What exactly is Hasidus? Of course, it's it's, it's definitely not a superficial movement just about externalities, right? The Kugel or there's some, some Hasidic movements are more famous for different things that they wear. And uh, the, 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 whether it's the, cur- the, the, the curly side locks or the, or the, or the, the, the way, the, the different, the white socks, the hats, the, the, the different foods they eat or different affiliation. It's definitely not just like some kind of club where we wear certain kinds of clothing or we eat certain kind of, we trust certain kind of supervision or we go to certain community websites. It's of course a lot more deeper than that. So what I wanna do in this class is explore various ideas 
that seem to be when it, the, they, they capture and express the essence of Hasidus, and then we're going to try to find a common unifying thread. Okay? And as we do that, we're going to have a good, at least 10 answers to how Hasidus can make a difference in our lives, and I'll try to point it out, of course, as we go through it. The, the first point we're going to start with is Hasidus is known for revolutionizing prayer. One of the accusations that the Alter Rebbe was accused of, besides for supporting the, the, they accused him of treason because he was supporting the, the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, which was at war with Russia because he was sending charity to support his friends who moved to the Holy Land. But they also said he's trying to start a new religion. And they brought up the thing that, the, this, the, the, the fact that Hasidic Jews, they made a, a very, they revolutionized prayer. They prayed for many hours. They made such a focus on it. And this was, they said, is foreign. And he started to, he tried to start a new religion. Right? You know, everyone knows in history, there was two, there were two uh, stages in history. There's BC and, and then afterwards, right? You know what that stands for, right? BC is for before Hasidus. And then there's after Hasidus. So this is a, a, a little joke from, that sort of expresses what might have been a major challenge before everyone could see on the screen, right? They, they see somebody, they, 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 somebody's davening is very, very poor, poorly inspired and lacking uh, any soul. It's burdensome. It's technical. When is it going to be over? This was a major issue before Hasidus. And Hasidus tried to bring back definitely a lot of the fire and appreciation for davening in Judaism. There's an anecdote about the about the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, that he was 18 years old. His 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 parents, who were disciples of the Rabbi Sorbal Shemtov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, they were actually instructed not to expose him to Hasidus in any way. He he was his destiny had to was that he had to choose it on his own, and. And at 18, he was a giant spiritually, but he was never exposed to Hasidus. And he needed something more. He needed a teacher. He wanted to, to advance spiritually. And he had two choices. This is what he himself shared later. He had Vilna, which was the, 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 the seat of the, really the opposition for Hasidus, but it was the home of the famous great genius and Torah scholar, Rebbe Leo, the, known as the Vilna Gon, the genius of Vilna. And in Mizrich, he heard about the Mizrich Magid, who we mentioned before, whose passing is also commemorated this day. And he said as follows, that I decided, I decided to go to Mizrich because I heard that in Vilna, you learn how to learn Torah and Talmud, but in Mizrich, you learn how to pray. And I know a little bit about learning Talmud, but I could definitely use a lot of uh, improvement in my prayer. And, and the rest is history. So what does this anecdote seem to illustrate? Well, we, the first point we said, that Hasidus seems to be captured by, by and expressed in prayer. This is what it's all about. One more anecdote. There's a famous Hasid who lived around 200 years ago, until 100, around 150 years ago. His name was Rabhilo Potash. He was a great, great rabbi, a great, great scholar and a great, great chassid. He was once walking by foot to travel to the Rebbe, then was at Semach Tzedek, the, the third generation of Chabad, Rabbi Menachem Mendel in Lubavitch, an actual Lub city of Lubavitch. And he met another Jew who had a wagon and offered to take him. He said, you know what? If I give you a ride tomorrow, Friday morning, you go with me, we'll make it to Lubavitch, we'll get to spend Lub Lubavitch with the Semach Tzedek. All you got to do is Commit to daven a little quicker tomorrow morning, and because I know you like to daven slow, and then if we leave by eight in the morning, then we'll make it to Lubavitch by, by before Shabbos. And Rabbi Hillel agreed. He said, okay, sounds like a plan. But the next morning, it seemed like Rabbi Hillel forgot all about the plan. Came nine, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. He was just lost in his prayers. And the, the, the other chassid decided to wait for him and if I bring together Shabbos in that other town, and after Shabbos, while they're traveling to Lubavitch, he asked him, how could you do that? 
How can you change what we made up? You made a deal. You're going to daven quicker on, on Friday morning so that we could go to, to make it to Lubavitch for Shabbos. And Rabbi will explain with an analogy. He said, imagine a lumber merchant who finds out that in Warsaw, a, a good few weeks journey away, say two weeks away, he's going to, he could get a great price on lumber. So he starts traveling and then halfway there, after traveling just a few days, he finds a, a town where they have a big sale of lumber, the exact same sale, the same price. So what should he do? Should he keep his original plan or should he change his plans and, and get it over here? Why should he schlep all the way further and, and for no reason? So I assume that it's obvious to you that if the davening goes good, there's no reason to travel to the Rebbe anymore. Why do we go to the Rebbe? The whole purpose why we're going to the Rebbe is to discuss our, our relation with Hashem. It's basically to, to help us daven better. That our davening should be a real outpouring of the soul and, and a connection to Hashem and being activating all the good traits that our godly soul has. And, and this is what we're trying to do. That's the whole purpose of Hasidus and going to the Rebbe. So if the davening is going, is working, so obviously I thought you would understand that, that there's no point in, in, in keeping to the original plan. So this is again another Hasidic story that brings out that Hasidus is all about enriching our davening and how davening is supposed to you know, be powerful, therapeutic and, 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 and life-changing. We could, we could really you know, bring out all the beautiful qualities that our godly soul has and become a whole different person and have a whole different kind of day through proper davening. Let's move on to another point. This is another famous idea, joy, simcha. This is always synonymous with Hasidic Jews. They were known for their dancing, their songs. This was definitely major ideas that they vary into. As a matter of fact, in their early generations of Hasidis, they were actually referred to, their nickname was the Freilich, the, the jolly ones, the joyous ones. They were always dancing and singing. And it seemed to be that that was what Hasidus is all about. There's a little story about this as well. That in the around 100 years ago, a little over 100 years ago, the times of the Rebbe Rashab, Rabbi Shalom Dover, he was the fifth Rebbe in the Chabad dynasty. He passed away in 1920. His birthday was actually uh, exactly a month ago, but that was in 1860 he was born. But his passing was in 1920, three generations ago. So there's a, he once had a chassid who asked him, Rabbi, I have a neighbor. Does he have to learn? Do I have to teach him Hasidus? He's a really great Jew. Do I have to try to pressure him to study Hasidus? So the Rebbe Rashab said, tell me about how he does mitzvahs. And he shared as follows, that when he does a, when he builds a sukkah, he, he would get up on the chair afterwards and kiss the schach and dance in the sukkah. So the Rebbe Rashab said, he's okay. You don't have to teach him Hasidus. He, which seems to illustrate that the whole idea of Hasidus is what? To have this joy, that excitement, and, and, and that, you know, that dance in your step in Judy, when it comes to Judaism, that's what it's all about. Important disclaimer, in our times, the Rebbe writes and spoke many times that we desperately need Hasidus, the, the combination of our, you know, the end of exile, the lowest sp spiritual sensitive level that we're on, you know, we, 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 it's, it's almost impossible to, to, not be, to not improve our divine service with Hasidus in our times. Let's move on to another point. Hasidus definitely seem to revolutionize and seems to be all about our um, upgrading and enhancing our appreciation for belief in a God and recognition of, of, of the reality of God and in this world. It's not so known, but one of the original big debates, I hope you all are aware that there was a lot of opposition. I mentioned before, some of you came later in the early generations and a lot of it was sincere. And in brief, I'll tell you one of the main points is that they each considered each other heretics. The, the, the non-Hasidic Jews, the opponents of Hasidus, or maybe we should say now to be in the PC generation, there were some people that were Hasidically challenged. They, they were saying, how could you say that God is in a, in, a, in a church, in a bathroom, God cares about worms and beetles? That's so insulting, that's so degrading, that's heresy. And the Hasidic Jews responded, how could you say God is not in a church or not in a bathroom or not in a sin or not in a beetle and a worm? And he's not concerned with these things. How could you say there's anything that exists out of God? That's heresy. So this whole idea of the perspective of how God 
created the world and creates the world and is Amen. running the world and how that works. Yeah. Now this is not even known anymore. Baruch Hashem, you know, the, the, the fight is pretty much precipitated and, and we moved on and most people don't even know. They all talk about, you know, how God is running everything, every detail of creation and so on. But this was a big controversy in the original generation. And there's some story about this as well. The, there's another famous Hasidic master who was a great friend of the founder of Chabad. His name was Rebbe Levi Yitzhak of Adichiv. Like many of the original Hasidic Jews, when they became Hasid, they got a lot of flack. And, and you know, unfortunately, there was a lot of misunderstanding and confusion. And they got a lot of harassment from their family, their friends, their communities. As a matter of fact, the, the, the infamous uh, character, Victor, who's the one behind, one of the main ones behind the Alter Rebbe's, incarceration that we're celebrating today the liberation of he was he started his career by having the, the Levi Yitzhak of Radichev, the Hasidic master who's known as such a lover of the Jewish people and a great a lawyer <coughs> of the Jewish people in Jewish in many you know many texts he was actually expelled but his family was expelled from Pinsk earlier by the same character but let's not talk about negative things on such a special day but anyway when he was starting to become a Hasid his father would always complain to him, why do you keep going to Mizrich? What do you get from there? You already were a great scholar and, and so on. And he told him once that I, what I gained from Miz, Mizrich is now that I know that there is a God. When he said that, his father-in-law lost it. He exploded. He's like, for this, you have to go to Madrid. Look at this Gentile maid. Let's go ask her. Said, Who created the world? See, she knows that it's God. She didn't go to Mizrich, and yet she knows that God created the world. What are you telling me? That's what you got from Mizrich. So Bedinche very calmly explained, she says it, and now I know it. So what does this anecdote seem to illustrate? That the whole Hasidus is all about making God real to us, having making our faith powerful and real and so on. So if you're with me, and if, for those of you who came in middle, when we finish doing our, you know, various points, I'm going to try to sum it up. Another point that seems to be what Hasidus is all about. It's a famous one. I hope it's everyone's favorite one. It seemed that Hasidus is definitely revolutionized and, and made such an emphasis on, on the mitzvah of Avash Yisrael, of loving your fellow Jew, treating, you know, treating them properly like yourself, like you like to be treated and so on, and focusing on, the, on our common... Uh, factors that unite us. We know that the Tanya is actually is referred to as the written text, like the Bible of Hasidus. And the, 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 the heart of the Tanya, chapter 32, is in Hebrew is, is Lamed Beis, which means heart, is actually a special chapter that the Rebbe added into the Tanya to at this afterwards to be the heart of the Tanya at this point. It's all about how we could really, really love another person despite our selfish nature and so on. And I mean, there's so many stories, but the, of, that in the early days of Chassidus, how the Baal Shem Tov would go around, one of the main, the, the famous descriptions in all the writings of Chassidus is how he would go and teach everyone and themselves to appreciate the simple, unsophisticated Jews who would serve God sincerely. They weren't so knowledgeable. Some of them could barely pray, could barely study, definitely not in-depth concepts. And they were very often not appreciated, not respected, degraded. They had like they weren't allowed in like regular synagogues. They were like a lower class. And the, the whole the Bashem that went around and revolutionized this. This is another reason why he got a lot of flack. Because he was going around saying that these simple Jews work very hard and they didn't really get a chance to learn Torah and be educated too much. And yet they try to say a little Psalms in the morning and they go and they pray sincerely the best they can, even though they make mistakes sometimes in words and they, they don't even know all the words, the translation, yet they try their best and they work and they serve Hashem and they, and they work honestly. And then they go to try to do a little class at night. They could be holier and closer to God and these scholars who are so full of themselves and they think that they're, they're so holy and they walk around looking down at these simple Jews and he, he turned everything around. And this is another major, another major concept that Hasidus was very famous for. There's also a little anecdote that the Baal Shem Tov's father told him on his, on his deathbed. He just made a little book about it, but 
no no uh, no advertising but it's this is a cute book that just came out i just found it and it talks about how valshemta was orphaned at five years old unfortunately from both of his parents and he was born there's a whole story about that it was very his parents are very, very elderly they had a special challenge in in hospitality that they sent from heaven to test him and then he, he passed they passed the test and he would they, they were they married it to have such a great child but they were very old and by the age of five he read he was orphaned from both his parents. His father, right before his father passed away, he told him the two points that we just mentioned about Hasid that became really the foundation of Hasidis. Not to fear anything or anyone besides Hashem. There's no reality outside of God. Nothing independent. And to love every Jew with all your heart. Just again, this brings out how this is all what Hasidis seems to be all about. Another famous idea. Mittal, it's called. Self-nullification is an, an attempt at a translation. It doesn't fully capture it. It does definitely does not mean the, you know, this kind of humble, I'm humbler than you attitude. It's 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 a it's more like a healthy self self-esteem where you know like they say true humility right is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's focusing on God. What could I do for Hashem? Not what's in it for me. Well, you know, who's going to notice me? What are other people going to think of me? To live in a, in a healthy way, spiritually and emotionally, to be focused, on, to be confident in yourself and, and being aware that you're in God's presence and you have a purpose and you have a mission and it's about what you could do for Hashem in a healthy way. A little story about this as well. <clears throat> there was a great chassid of the Alter Rebbe who was once asked, he was such a great scholar. You knew all the areas of, of Torah, the, 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 the Talmud, Halacha, the Medrash. even was familiar with Kabbalah. What did you really gain from Hasidus? So he explained to them that the only thing that changes the, the question I used to have. The answer is still the same. I used to have a question as follows. I'm so great. I'm such a great, holy, righteous Jew. I serve our God so so meticulously. I'm so I'm so studious. I pray so passionately. How is God ever going to possibly possibly be able to come up with enough Ganadin, with enough reward in the world to come to 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 give me a fair reward for what I for what I deserve? I'm because I'm so great. And the only answer I could come up with is that it says in the holy books that God is a kol yachol. He's all powerful. He could, he'll somehow find a way to give me enough reward. And then when I became a chassid, just the question changed. I start to have a different kind of question. How does God tolerate my existence? I'm so, why does he, how can he not like blot, blot me out of existence? I, I, my ego, it smells so much. I'm so like petty. I'm so animalistic. I'm so like always thinking about others. Like I can't, I'm so far from God. Why does he tolerate me? And my answer is the same. God is so great and so powerful that he finds a way even to tolerate me and to believe in me despite my, 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 my repeatedly behaving like an animal and being so selfish and into just running after what makes me feel good and so on. So again, this anecdote seems to illustrate that Hasidus is all about this bittel, this healthy perspective of foc not focusing so much on yourself and, be in, and, and instead of focusing and living your life in a way that you... You care about what God wants. <clears throat> Another famous idea that definitely seemed to be what Hasidus is all about is the idea of a Rebbe. Uh, the, 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 uh, a leader, the connection with the Jewish leaders, the general souls. It's, it's a famous uh, line in Ayam Yam. I already mentioned before, those of you who came later, that in history, there's divided into two stages. There's BC and then afterwards. And BC stands for, of course, before Hasidus. So the Ayayim Yayim says, before the Hasidic movement, the, the Nasi, the leader, wasn't so connected. The people were separated and it wasn't an open connection. The relationship was just not the same. This is actually one of the biggest points of opposition that the, against the Hasidic movement. It's also a famous phrase that the very and famous more in the non-Chabad Hasidic movements about how the whole idea the best way to serve God is to be connected to the righteous person and they lift you up they inspire you and they guide you and they help us and they teach us and that's 
that's a that's a, a super solid way to have to have a healthy relationship with Hashem. The the, the, the righteous souls they're more connected. They see the truth and then and they're able to connect us much smoother. This is a major point in Hasidus, and it's one of the biggest points of opposition as well. People didn't understand this. People challenged this. And they're like, what, the, what are we doing intermediaries? What's the correct, correct perspective? But of course, we'll, we'll explain later a little more how this, of course, this is the, this is just comes from a misunderstanding and has a lot of basis in, in authentic Judaism. And we'll, we'll get to that a little more later in the class. There's another major point, another idea. Since Hasidus came to reinvigorate a deflated and demoralized nation, we'll do a little history. Anyone know what the statue is? This is pretty random, but I'll be impressed if someone knows who this is. I saw this when I was in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, in the center of the city. I was shocked when I saw this. It's a big statue of a man named Bogdan Khalmanitsky. He was uh, officially in there. In their, in, in, I asked about it. He's, a, he's like a, a hero in their history. He, he made a revolution. He led a Cossack uprising against the noblemen in the year 1648. It lasted for approximately a decade. And, and he tried to fight, officially they say, he was helping the peasants, you know, to get a little more freedom and rights. Or they were being oppressed by the noblemen. But in Jewish history, this is why I was so shocked. He, he's one of the worst villains. He's right up there with Haman and Hitler. He killed approximately with his men. They, they butchered and massacred between the, over 300 thousand or between the 300,000 and half a million Jewish people without bullets by hand and by 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 by, by, by terrible ways with knives and axes they went to town town with his with his armies and they and they viciously murdered so many Jews they they and the and the Jewish community was was de was crushed and devastated afterwards for decades they was they lost and they were injured and they were homeless and they were poor and they were physically they were knocked out terribly by what happened in this in that in that war and by the way it was percentage wise it was equal to the holocaust it was also approximately a third of the jewish people at that time because there wasn't so many jews and 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 they were, it were, they were they were not recovering easily from this they were so devastated and crushed there were families that were lost and, a, and apart, even survivors for decades afterwards, they were still finding each other. It was really, really difficult. And because they all fled to the big cities, they didn't have mm. livelihood. Mm. They were all poor and beggars and homeless, so many of them. And it was a terrible situation physically. Then, around approximately 10 years afterwards, he actually used this, this terrible story to, to help him. There was a famous, infamous false Mashiach. Who, who, who tricked a lot of the Jewish people in that time, and he got them all excited. And then it, after a few years, it came crushing down when he converted to Islam and the whole thing collapsed and all their hopes were dashed. And then now the Jewish people were knocked out physically and spiritually. They were deflated. They were dejected. They were so despair, in a despair. And it says they were in a state of his alphus, like in a faint. And this is, and it's one of the things that's, that's, no, when someone's in a coma, when someone's knocked out, sometimes you can wake them up. You try to say their name. So it's so it's explained that the, the Baal Shem Tif came on the scene to wake up the Jewish people, to reinvigorate them. He was named Yisrael, which is the collective name of the Jewish people. So this is another point to explain what seems what Hasidus is all about. It came to reignite, to wake us up again. Another way to put this, it says in the Mishnah, in the Talmud, that Matan Torah, right, the launching of the Jewish people, the most important event when God revealed himself to, to, to a few million people, the whole Jewish nation, and he, he, he started Judaism, is, we entered into a special relationship with us, it actually is described as a marriage. So, this is a pretty turbulent marriage. And uh, but it's a big, it's a, it's on a much bigger scale. Obviously, it's talk, we're talking about Hashem and the Jewish people, and there's a lot of insights that that come from this analogy. You can have a whole class just about that. A lot of times, you could guide yourself. You could learn about how to serve Hashem from from a good marriage, and you could learn from a relation with Hashem about how to have a good marriage. It goes both ways, and that's a whole other discussion. But it's compared to a marriage, and 
around a thousand years later, yeah, this is this is the Matan Torah was like a, a wedding, and a thousand years later we were having some marriage issues. Again, this is my own way of putting it, but it, it's pretty insightful. It'll explain a lot of Jewish history or some major points in Jewish history. So we came to therapy, and we and there was complaints. The marriage is not the same. Used to be so much excitement and passion and expression, and, and it's just not it's not the same. It happens. It's normal. <clears throat> So the therapists in this case were known as the Anshik Nesak Doila. Around a thousand years after the Exodus, we're talking about the beginning of the Second Temple era. That's when a lot of structure came to Judaism. They said, you have to start communicating words of affection to your spouse consistently and often. It's a real thing, by the way, in marriages. The idea of you have to connect all the time. And if you don't, you're like, you have to make it up and you have to express things and so on. And Sometimes you got to force yourself. So this is what they gave from starting in Judaism began at this time. Before then, people didn't need to be told how much to pray, which words to say. They, were, they felt it. It was natural. But all the, 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 the structure sort of came from this, from this point in history. Around We're talking about the beginning of the Second Temple around 2,500 years ago. <clears throat> then that worked for around 2,000 years. Then we're back in therapy. Now we got too caught up in the pettiness, in the technical, but just the structure to overtook us. We got so caught up in the structure and the and the, the technical part of it. We're losing the sight of the relationship. We're just checking off, saying these words, but we're ignoring each other. So this time we came to therapy to the Baal Shem Tov. Hasidus came to bring back, to balance out, to reignite the passion and so on, the feelings, the excitement. It's another idea, another perspective about what Hasidus came to do. Another point. Before Hasidus, we had Talmud on our shelves. We had Shulchan Aruch. We had uh, the Rambam. We had various Jewish texts. And along came Hasidus. And boom, we have, <laughs> we have so many more books of Torah and insights. Hasidus is definitely a layer of Torah interpretation. It has a lot of commentary and, and insights and explanations for the laws and the stories of the Torah. So we're going to definitely have to tie that in to our, our list of what Hasidus contributed. It gives us so much more insights and details in the Torah. I'll just tell you a little joke about that. They say that a woman just once walked into the Judaica store in Brooklyn in Crown Heights and she's like, um, can I have three shelves of blue, two shelves of red, and one shelf of purple? She was buying books. She was ordering books. She wanted to decorate her wall, right? But that's not what Jewish books are for, right? It's not just to, to make a nice matching colors. You're supposed to open them and study them and, and, and use them, right? The most beautiful books are the ones that are worn out and, and falling apart from use and so on. Okay, another point. A major one. It seems to be that Chassidus is very, very much connected to Mashiach. Very focused on this. From day one, it's actually a story of the Baal Shem Tev. He sheared, they have the letter. He sheared in a letter to his brother-in-law, Rabbi Gershon of Kitover, who, he writes as follows, that one year in Rosh Hashanah, the actual Rosh Hashanah, the first day of Tishrei, he describes, he was a very, the Baal Shem Tev was a very holy spiritual person and he he had a kind of out of body experience during his prayers his soul like went on a journey in the spiritual realm and he found the chamber of Mashiach this is what he writes in his letter we all know that there's a soul a special soul of Mashiach that is waiting for when God says to go down and attach yourself to a certain Jewish leader down in this world when the time comes that's what we're all waiting for but he went he couldn't wait he went to, to meet the soul of Mashiach in the heavenly chamber, and he asked him, that's the Baal Shem Tov Shul, by the way, and we reconstructed it now, and he asked him as follows, when, Amos I call Simar, it's Aramaic for, when is the master going to come already? What can we do to, 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 to achieve the redemption sooner? And the, and the Mashiach, the soul of Mashiach responded, that when your wellsprings, the teachings of Hasidus that you are introducing to the world, when they will spread outward, when they will reach the extremities of the Jewish nation and, and of the world, that's when the redemption will happen. So what does this story illustrate? That seems to be Hasidus is all about preparing for the redemption. 
There's also a famous song about that. If I, I don't know if I'll do it now, but you could ask your rabbi later. Maybe he'll, he'll teach you that song to these words. A famous Hasidic melody. By the way, this is still going on. This is what Chabad is famous for now. We're still trying to reach every single Jew. That's that's on Mars, by the way, but I think it's Photoshop. I don't know if they got there yet. But, but, the, the, but the mitzvah tanks are real. They're still trying and going Chabad houses. You hear about all the time. It's the same idea still going on. We want to reach everywhere and, in, and bring them the light of Torah and the light of Hasidus. There's also another famous question about why was Hasidus revealed at this point in history? Judaism is going on for, for over three and a half thousand years almost. And uh, Hasidus, the Baal Shem Tev was born in 1698. The Hasidic movement started approximately 1734. That's when he revealed himself. There's a whole story about it. Talking less than 300 years ago. Why at this point? And there's basically two answers that are given. One is that as we get towards the end of exile, the darkness, the spiritual darkness, is intensifies the challenges. There's more confusion. We're less spiritually sensitive. We're not naturally in touch with our soul, with God. And we needed that boost. The ego is stronger. The animal soul is stronger. There's darkness and confusion. So the Hasidists came to help us navigate the difficult challenges at the end, at the end of exile. But it's also, in a positive way, a preparation. Before Shabbos, is supposed to prepare and taste the food of Shabbos. It's part of the preparation. So it says that Hasidus is giving us a little bit of a taste, an inkling of of the great revelations that's going to be when Mashiach comes. So again, you see how it's very much connected to Mashiach. And one more final point before we try to wrap it up is what does the Talmud have to say about this? The Talmud actually gives, gives a definition of what is Hasidus. In Tractate Baba Kama, page 30a, it asks the question, how do you become a Hasid? I'm on the boil of Hasidah. How do, you, how do you become a, a pious Jew? Which is the literal translation of chassid. And it gives three answers. Number one, become an expert in, I'll do it out of order because it's, it's more contrast. The first answer is become an expert in the tractate of the Talmud that deals with nizikin, injuries, damages, responsibilities, accountability, to be super sensitive to other people's pain, to other people's discomfort, to other people's feelings, and so on. This is the most important area. If you want to be a chassid, not just a regular Jew, a super Jew, you want to be a pious, you want to be really holy, you got to be sensitive to other people's feelings. That's the most important. Then another answer is, Rafa says, you have to, or, or the next, the, the, I'll do the other one first. It's, 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 it goes the opposite extreme. Um, some people say, learn tractate brachas. The first tractate in the entire Talmud, which is basically all about blessings and prayers and Shema. It's your relationship with Hashem. And a third answer is basically both. I mean, he said, learn piki avos. Don't do be above and beyond. Whatever you have to do in both areas, in between man and man, and between man and God, don't just do what you have to do. Do more than you have to do. Do what the best you could do. Do beyond the letter of the law. This is what uh, the tractate of Piki Yavis is all about. And the, the third one was, is, is like your relation with Hashem. It's also, a, the Talmud brings an illustration for who's a chassid. It says that a uh, According to the Talmud, the, the Jewish tradition, if, when you cut your nails, if you throw it down, it could cause harm to a pregnant woman. She steps on it, you could have a, a miscarriage, but it's also spiritually, it could be um, it could, it could be detrimental. We don't even always have to understand exactly why, but it could cause harm. So it says a wicked person, someone who's inconsiderate of others, that, someone just discards it, doesn't care, he throws it down. A righteous person buries it. He tries to make sure that no one will step on it. And a chassid burns it. A burning something that comes from your own body could also not be good spiritually. But he's so extreme in his sensitivity that he shouldn't, God forbid, cause any pain. So he even even will uh, even will burn the nails to be extra careful. It also takes a lot more time than just burying it. Those days, you know, they didn't have lighters, right? So 
This is the idea of Hasidus, to do above and beyond what you have to do. This is the Talmud's definition. I'll just share one more insight we just had in the parasha uh, just last week about the scene with Yaakov. He covers his head with stones and he, you know, he has the dream, the famous dream with the ladder. So I'll just share with you a fascinating insight. We know there's many layers of Torah interpretation. So I, I, I saw a beautiful commentary that what did he protect his head with? And why did he only protect his head? If he was concerned about the wild animals, as Rashi says, why didn't he protect the rest of his body? And it's explained that he was teaching us the secret to success in life, how to raise, he was the first one to raise a, a, a proper Jewish family in a hostile spiritual environment, in the, in, not in the Holy Land. So what did he do? In order to do this, he protected his head. You got to protect your head. Save your head space for your family. Save your head space for your soul. Don't get too overwhelmed with your business with your, your hobbies, your other side things, the most important part of you has to be saved for what's really important. This is what Jacob was teaching us. And <clears throat> by the way, the, the, the Rebbe explains, this is from a talk of the Rebbe, that this also addresses the animals too. It's not, it's not just a nice Hasidic interpretation because the Talmud teaches us that animals will only attack a, a human being if he appears to them like another animal. But if you do, if you just protect your head properly, then you don't appear like an animal. That's how you make yourself a spiritual being. So this is the a nice interpretation. But I want to show you. You see those big letters on the screen of those three answers of how to be a chassid. It actually stands for the olive base nun. It spells the word stone in Hebrew, Evan. <laughs> it's an acronym. This is also the, this is the secret. How did Yaakov protect himself? Protected his head with what? By being a chassid. By, by implementing the ideas of all the opinions of chassidus. All the opinions. Between man and man. Between man and God. And so on. And to do everything in the best way possible. Okay. So let's sum up a little bit. And also some of you I noticed came in in the middle. So we discussed basically. This is not going to be in order. But we're going to go over 10 points we had. That it seemed, we try to show, I hope I, I, I illustrated it at least briefly, how Hasidus is all about each of these points. Let's just, let me just bring them all up. We said all these points. We, we said how it's all revolutionized prayer. It's bringing the joy. It, it, it you know, upgraded our faith. It taught us about true perspective on yourself and the world. How to really love another Jew, not just you know, superficially and what's in it for you and the ones that are your type, but even another Jew who's different than you and so on, about bringing Mashiach and the connection to Mashiach, how it brings insights in Torah, which is, by the way, the last thing we did was an example of a Hasidic layer of Torah interpretation. The idea of a Rebbe and the connection to Jewish leaders and to connect to Hashem through that, to bring back the passion, to save, to, to, to reinvigorate oh. the Jewish people. And we spoke about how it's, I said, this is all about going above and beyond, not just doing what you have to do, and but even more than you have to do. And this is already a um, beautiful um, reflection for the day. So the day, today is the Rosh Hashanah of Hasidus. This is the, t these are 10 ways how Hasidus really helps us in our Judaism. This is, we know that a special day on the Jewish calendar whether it's a regular holiday or a Hasidic holiday, is not just about having a nice special experience on that day. It's about taking from that day special spiritual gifts and powers. Just like Rosh Hashanah helps us accept God as our king whenever we have a difficulties and struggles and challenges and we're wavering with choices and temptations throughout the year. And Yom Kippur helps us repair and cleanse our relationship with Hashem, the idea of tshuva, not just on Yom Kippur, but we try to take the power of tshuva with us. Whenever it happens throughout the year, you might know someone that sometimes makes a mistake and has to do tshuva another time in the year, and so on and so forth. Every holiday helps us with different things. So this is a little bit of what the, the Rosh Hashanah of Hasidus helps us to improve our prayer, our attitude, our joy, our concern for others, our faith our perspective itself, our connection with our Jewish our Torah leaders, and so on and so forth. But now I want to, we have 10 minutes left. I want to try to see if we could tie them all into one point to try to sum up what is Hasidus all about? If there, is there one point? Because this is like a lot of answers. And if someone says, what exactly is Hasidus? I don't know if you could say, 
come sit down. I'll show you a whole PowerPoint and let's, you know, go through all this. There's got to be a way to sum it all up into one nikuda, one essential point. Right? That's the question we're asking. Which one is it? Is it this? Is it this? Is it all about this? Is it, you know, it seems a little bit even like a, a paradox. Like, it seems to be that Hasidus is expressed by each one of these points totally. It's like, this is what all of Hasidus, this is what it's all about. How could it be? It's 10 different points. Introduction number one. One second. You know, before we go to this, and maybe if there's any questions, because I'm going to try to tie it in, but it's a good point. If you want to do any questions, I could do it now. Just got to unmute yourself. Or I could go on. Okay. I don't have any questions. I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm my audio is off. But as long Rabbi, as you're ready, when I'm will, going to continue. Rabbi, when will this be up on YouTube? That you'll have to ask Rabbi Smith. And he's muted. You're muted. Oh. In, okay. in, in about an hour or two. That's a shame. Okay, we're ready to go on. Um, so introduction number one. Again, we're going to try to tie it in. So the previous rabbi in the picture there, who, whose passing was in, in 1950. So there's a story once that he was in a hotel in, in Vienna, and he was meeting a, a delegation of Jews to deal with different communal matters. And... And then one of them asked him a question while he was in the hotel lobby. He asked him, you know, I was always wondering, well, how would you describe Hasidus? What did it really contribute to the innovate in Judaism? What really came because of the Hasidic movement? What do we have new from them? How would you answer that? And he, he took the lantern they had and he showed it on one of the flowers or one of the designs. It was a very pretty wall decorated with in the hotel lobby. And he pointed out one of the designs and he said, you see this flower? And he said, yes. Um, did you notice it before I shined a light on it? Not really. But was it there before? Definitely. So that's exactly what Hasidus did. It didn't innovate nothing in Judaism. We don't make new things. Everything that existed was there before. It's just a matter of emphasis and highlighting and shining a light. For example, there's a medrash in Medrash Tanchuma, says that when God created the world, I didn't, I'll translate, I forgot to put the English here. Um, when God created the world, and his point was he desired to have a dwelling place in the lowest realm. He wanted to have a relationship with, with beings in the lowest level of reality. And we don't mean spatial over here. It's not about physically up and down. We mean the lowest levels. And the definition of the lowest is in a, in a reality where they could choose not to. That's why it's compared to a marriage. The whole greatness of a marriage, a sibling, you can't choose not to be siblings. But in a marriage, on many levels, you have to choose to be close, choose to enter the marriage and, and keep choosing to connect. And that's very that's what God wanted with creation. He wanted someone distant from him who has the option. That's what makes us low. We could actually ignore God. And in our, in our world, you could get away with denying God, challenging God, ignoring God. And that makes us the lowest realm, which parenthetically, you ever find yourself struggling with, with, you know, you feel like you have doubts and you want things that are bad and you, you're pulled and you have drives and impulses that are animalistic. It doesn't make us bad. It doesn't make us low. This makes us holy and perfectly qualified to give God exactly what he wants. He wants to have a home in the lowest realm. Anyway, what the Hasidists do, it just made a big deal about this medrash. It started quoting it left and right elaborating. You have entire Hasidic discourses, hundreds of pages just discussing the, the every word in detail. What does it mean a home? What did God desire? Which level? Uh, God's essence, you know, what does it mean the definition of the lowest realm? But it was all there. It was there before. It's just shining a light on it. Some more quick examples. Again, I'll translate them. It's, it says in Tehillim, in the Psalms from King David, and we say it every day in the prayers, that our service of God has to be imbued with joy. Sibis didn't invent this. It says every day, in the, it says in the, in the Bible and in the prayers, every single day we mention that they believed in God and in Moshe as servant. This is the idea of a rabbi. It's not, it's not something new Hasidus did. We say it in the prayers all the time, that there's an idea of a Moshe Rabbeinu, 
a general soul who's like a leader who, who helps us connect to God. And Hasid is just, again, we refreshed it and so on. It talks about in the prayer that if you pray, it says in the Talmud that if you pray long, you'll live longer. Hasid didn't say, oh, stop praying long, a new idea. And of course, the idea of prayers in Judaism. Of course, the Rabbi Akiva taught that the whole Torah is about loving your fellow Jew like yourself. This is the whole Judaism. According to Rabbi Akiva, according to Hillel, Hasid is just reminded people, refreshed this, maybe highlighted it, taught people how to give people tips and how to do this and so on. That's intro number one. Hasidus didn't invent things. It just, it's important to know that it's just a matter of focus and emphasis. Um, number two, intro number two. We don't have, a, the, Rabbi Smith, do we have time? You, you, can like go on. You, you can go over, over time if people, if people, can uh, leave. If people want to leave, they you know, they can leave, of course. Of course. Yeah. Okay. But it's not going to turn off. The meeting is not going to shut. Not turning off. Hour. That's what, it's, it's because not by my class, off. I have 40 minutes and I'm done. My oh. One of my daily classes. So I'm just making sure. Yeah. Okay. So no pressure, but I'm going to try to wrap up. So everything that exists has two dimensions. These are just a bunch of synonyms. There's an inner and outer, we call it a body or a soul, physical and spiritual. Sometimes in, in Kabbalah, they use the words vessel and light, but it's, it's all about these two layers. We all have it, everything. For example, there's the musical instrument and there's the music. It's like the body and the soul. It's the physical and the spiritual. There's in the body, there's the person, and then there's the, there's the, there's the, the flesh, the muscles, the bones, and then there's there's something more. There's the consciousness. There's the soul. There's the the, anim, the animating power. In a book, you have the ink. You have the you have the material of the paper, and then you have the content. You know, when you talk, there's sound waves, and then there's the actual words, the message, the the connection. So everything has two layers. So basically, Hasidus is all about focusing on the deeper layer of everything. That's all it is. It's in yourself. How to look at yourself? Don't be superficial in your perspective. Focus on your deeper layer of yourself, your soul. And others, the same thing. When you look at the world, when you look at reality, look deeper. Look, focus not on the externalities and the superficial, but on the soul of everything. In Torah, there's stories, there's laws. They have a body and a soul. The Hasidus teaches us to focus on the soul. This is, now I'll try to, if you give me, bear with me another minute, I'll try to tie it into all the different points we, we mentioned in the class. Living with the soul will explain how all those ideas we mentioned, it really comes down to this point. When you live with the soul in yourself, from the perspective of your body, it's very hard to, to have joy in Judaism. It's burdensome. You could do this, you can't do that. But if you, if you live in a way that your soul is more important than your perspective, then you could really have joy. You could really, from your body's perspective, it's hard to, to be, you get, you're selfish. Your animal nature is not bad, but it's self-centered, like an animal. You want to have pleasure and you want to have it now. But if you can connect with your soul, your godly soul, then you could really be selfless and focused on others and so on. You could not be so egotistical. You could, you davening is a time. It's the time when you, the time that's designated to try to activate your soul. When you focus on the soul and the others, this translates into, this is how you can really truly love another person. It's literally impossible to really love another person like yourself if you're just uh, from your body's perspective or your animal soul's perspective. It's just not possible. You love yourself more. But if you could train yourself the way you live your life, that your soul is more important than my body, which means you, you when I have choices, what's better for my soul? What would What would be... What would my soul appreciate? And you you not you ingrain in yourself to live with your soul, then from that perspective, you can really love another person. It's not a contradiction. Because from a soul perspective, we are indeed all one and unified. We all are equally a part of God. To really respect, not just tolerate and accept, but respect and cherish every individual, even the ones that are different than us, and so on. And this is the whole idea of, of outreach as well. That Chabad is very famous for. In reality, you, the way we will view the world, we will we'll realize not just look at things that are happening as 
as like just like the body at the outside of it. There's Hashem is acting inside of it. Hashem is doing things. Everything that's happening is Hashem is orchestrating it. Hashem is pulling the strings. Hashem is of course has a plan for the whole history. It's not just you know random struggles and we, there's a it's a goal. We're going towards Mashiach. This is all comes from a deeper perspective. Again, in yourself, in others, in reality. And of course, in Torah, Hasidus teaches us how every law and every story and narrative in the Torah is timeless. It, that's the definition of the word Torah. It has meaning, it has timeless relevance and meaning to every single Jew everywhere in the world, no matter where they may be, and in a personal way. And all the stories, sometimes every character... In the Torah, every story happens in our lives somehow. Every character we we deal with, every villain is represents a challenge we might deal with. Every hero gives a, empowers us in a certain area. It's all inside of us, and this is what Hasidus teaches us. Makes everything so relevant. The idea of a Rebbe is a, is a general soul. It's called an Ashama Klalis. That's how he, he connects. You know, brings out our souls and so on. And so basically, in a nutshell, how would we say it? I said this is about living deeper, not so superficial in all our relationships, starting with ourselves, in our relationship with others, in our relationship with the world, and our perspective. To be deeper, this day helps us to live deeper. That's what it's all about. Thank you very much. I'm getting a bunch of phone calls from my wife because I also told her I'm going to be done at 10 or 11. So if you have any questions... You could actually WhatsApp or tell Robert Smith, and I'll try to answer you later, but I, I sort of have to run now. So thank you very much. Oh, I have to end off with a blessing. This is what we wish each other this day, that we should have be blessed with an exciting, successful year in Limon Exodus and in Daich Exodus, full of joy and health and the ways of Hasidus and, 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 the, and the behavior, the way we should live our, align our, our lives with our souls, and then we'll be more wholesome and have only revealed blessings. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you, Thank you Rabbi. Happy New Year. Thank Goodbye. you, Rabbi. Happy New Year. Good to meet you. Thank you, you Rabbi. Good yontif. Yeah, we'll talk later. Good yontif.